Hi everybody, it's Susan Thornton with the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation and welcome to our September kickoff of our fall season of Facebook Live programs and other patient educational programs. And uh, welcome back from your summer and we really thank everybody for joining us tonight. And our guest this evening is Dr. Bassam William, who's joining us from the Ohio State Comprehensive Cancer Center in Columbus. And he is the director of the T-cell lymphoma program there, which of course encompasses cutaneous lymphomas. And thanks for joining us this evening, Dr. William. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. And so tonight, um, our topic is clinical trials, which I know is really of interest to everyone. And there's a lot going on in the area of clinical trials and cutaneous lymphoma, which I think is so very exciting. And Dr. Williams is going to share with you a little bit about some of the clinical trials and about the clinical trial process uh, and what's happening in the world of cutaneous lymphoma. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. William and allow him to take it from here. Remember that you can uh, write in your questions on the cutaneous lymphoma site and we'll be uh, after the presentation doing an open Q&A. So let us know what questions you have and we'll do our best to get to everybody's question before the end of the show at the top of the next hour. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over and, and we'll talk a little bit about clinical trials in cutaneous lymphoma. Great. Thank you, Susan. Um, I thought I would start by just um, uh, giving a brief overview. Why do we need uh, new treatments for uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma? How do we think about cutaneous T-cell lymphoma as clinician? And for us in the academic world, um, when we think about developing new clinical trials, how, how, what's our thought process and where, where is our need and how, that, how does that fit into the current treatments we have? So um, first question is whenever we have, we, whenever we uh, think about uh, uh, developing a clinical trial, why do we need to develop a clinical trial? Well, first of all, as, uh, 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 as, 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 as all of you know, uh, uh, living with that disease, CTCL remains an incurable disease. Um, uh, short of bone marrow transplant, which we're gonna touch on a little bit later in the presentation, we have no current curative treatment for CTCL. Um, the currently available treatments are inconvenient. So as topical therapist, you have to apply a topical agent to multiple parts of the body if there's a, a, a large uh, body surface areas involved, and that takes time and uh, uh, effort and is very inconvenient. Uh, light therapy to start had to be delivered at least two to three times a week. For, uh, for folks who live in, in rural communities, they might not have access to a dermatologist's office to go and get that kind of treatment. Uh, and there's also uh, a cost factor involved with insurance coverage and so forth. Um, we have effective treatment, but as many of you know from experience, they are toxic. So histone deacetylase inhibitors as uh, this class of drug like vorinostat pills or romidepsin infusion, um, they cause that very um, uncomfortable taste feeling in the mouth that many folks are unable to eat. Their quality of life is not good with that. And um, that might be a pretty limiting factor of uh, receiving such an effective treatment. Uh, Brentoximab vidotin is uh, a new treatment that uh, many many of you are familiar with or have been presented to you at some part of your journey. Um, it's about one of the most effective Asian we have. Uh, neuropathy, inflammation in nerves, uh, presenting as pins and needles on the hand and feet or eventually weakness if left unchecked, um, is limiting and is cumulative with time. So with such an effective agent, we're limited by how much we can give it because of that neuropathy develops at some point in time on a good, good proportion of patients. And historically, although that changing was a new agent, many of the agents we have, the responses to them had not been durable. 
So something works for a few months and then stops working and then you have to switch to something else. Um, one other thing that's peculiar about cutaneous T-cell lymphoma is that we think about it as it sees in multiple compartments of the body. So you have the skin and there's certain agents that work better in the skin. And then uh, some folks would have blood involvement and there's certain agents that work better in the blood. So whenever we design clinical trials, we have to design clinical trials with, in mind to have agents that work within different compartments. Um, as clinician, how do we think about cutaneous T-cell lymphoma? Like when I see a new patient who's referred to me, what's my current uh, 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 thought process? Um, it's a lifelong disease, so in general, we need to practice what we call therapeutic restraint. Um, the way I, um, uh, when I talk to my patients, I would say, you don't want to be shooting a fly with a machine gun. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> so if you have a disease or uh, a presentation of the disease that it's very indolent, uh, a person have just one patch on their body, you cannot give them, or you shouldn't be giving them chemotherapy. That would be an overkill. So the principle, uh, that principle is called therapeutic restraint. It means that you have to be careful because if it's a disease that a person will live with all of their life, uh, you have to use the least toxic treatment first and work your way to the more um, uh, perhaps effective, but perhaps more uh, toxic treatments. Um, we treat based on the stage of the disease. So if it's only limited to the skin, we look at the topical agent like steroids, light therapy. Uh, there is a special form of radiation that's given only to the skin. It's only available in big um, academic medical center who have the right equipment and expertise to develop that kind of treatment, which is also a limitation. And then when we look at advanced stage disease, and we'll touch on uh, stage in a minute, uh, we look at biological agents, so uh, monoclonal antibodies, which are drugs like, like MOGA or brentuximab, treatments like romidepsin and, and chemotherapy. We still use that in selected situation. Um, early referral to a bone marrow transplant is advisable in advanced stage, and uh, probably every patient should uh, see uh, a BMT specialist at one point throughout their journey to make sure this is not um, something they could be considered for. And uh, per the, N, uh, uh, the NCCN, the National Comprehensive Cancer Center Network Guidelines, all patients should be considered for clinical trials. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to walk you through stage if you're not familiar with Stage is very uh, complicated and it has evolved over the years. But the simple way I think about it is we look at what we call early stage disease. So it's a disease limited to the skin. So if we have stage 1A and 1B, 1A is less than 10% of body surface area, typically a few patches. And we use the same uh, scale that burn clinician use. If it's more than 10% body surface area, it's stage 1B. And then when it is stage 2, patient will typically have skin tumors. And when the whole skin is red and, and itchy, that's a condition we call erythroderma. And then if there are cells detectable in the blood circulating cesare cell, that would be stage 4. So stage 1 limited to skin. Stage two is skin tumor, stage three is erythema, the whole skin is red, and stage four is circulating cells. And if the disease is limited to the skin and it's only patches and plaques so with no tumor, we consider that early stage. If it is tumors or more beyond that, erythroderma or circulating cell, we think about that as advanced stage. And that's also important as we think about clinical trials because uh, typically, because CTCL is a rare disease, clinical trials would encompass patient at mostly all stages, perhaps with the exception of those who have a very limited involvement of the skin, like less than 10%. But then as we develop agent, there are more agents that seem to be more suitable for advanced stage, 
and others that seem to be more suitable for early stage. And we'll get into that in, in, in a minute. So I just want to also take a few more minutes to walk you about the current treatment landscape for CTCL. Like when I see new patients with CTCL, how do I think about what treatment to offer them? Uh, again, just to refresh your memory, stage 1A is less than 10% body surface area, typically a few patches on the skin, no tumors. Stage 1B is more than 10% body surface area, so a big part of the body is covered with patches or plaques. Stage 2 B is skin tumor, stage three is the whole skin is red as erythroderma, and stage four is circulating cells. So if I am seeing a patient who have a limited involvement of the skin, I could offer them a topical steroid, something like triamcinolone or similar. We have uh, a multitude of topical agents that all um, that some fall into the chemotherapy class like mustard, some are more uh, biologic response modifier like pixarotene or imiquimod. Um, we could consider light therapy, um, perhaps when patients don't have skin tumors, because usually it doesn't work well for skin tumors. Light therapy seems to be attractive. They have a lot of skin involvement without skin tumors. If, if a patient would have one or two tumors that you can just radiate, you would, you get, would give a small dose of radiation and that should be sufficient. Um, there is a total skin electro beam radiation, which is um, rad a radiation that's designed to only penetrate into a skin, doesn't penetrate into internal organ, and it's given all over the body, head to toe. Um, it requires a lot of technical expertise and calibration of the instrument. It's typically only available in a big academic medical center. It's a nice treatment, though, because patients would, would finish their treatment in a two-week course, so they could take time off work and stay locally for two weeks, get that treatment done, get it over with, and they could enjoy a nice few years of remission out of that and typically can be given about three times in a, in a personal lifetime of, until you reach the maximum treat, maximum life uh, long um, treatment dose. And then with stage three erythroderma or stage four circulating cell, we could do a procedure called photophoresis which is basically we um, have the patient sit on the blood bank machine. We start a small intravenous line. It pulls their blood out and we mix it with an agent that makes cells more sensitive to light. It's all, in, uh, it's all automated within the blood bank instrument. And then we expose it to light. And that somehow kills the malignant cells that are circulating or some cells are activated. It could also work for early stage patients as well. Um, it doesn't work as well for patients who have skin tumors, but could work for, it, it works best for patients who have erythroderma. Sometimes we'd combine it with two other Asian, Bixarotene, which is an, a vitamin A uh, analog, and interferon, which is um, an agent that's given by an injection that will make the person on immune cell active against the, the lymphoma cells. Um, those same treatment, the bexerotene, typically a pill. Uh, vorinostat is another pill and the interferon, it's uh, given as an injection. Uh, we give those in um, stage 1B disease, a lot of skin informant. They also have activity of skin tumor and in erythroderma. When we see erythroderma, we typically combine this treatment with photophoresis. Um, as we move more to a more advanced stages, uh, we're looking at tumors or um, uh, involvement of the blood. Uh, we would use agents like mogamil mogamilizumab, which is an antibody. It works better for the leukemic type where there is a lot of blood involvement. Rintoximab is also an antibody um, that works well for skin tumors. Uh, romidapsin is another <coughs> agent for injection, or we could use classic chemotherapy. And then bone marrow transplant is reserved for advanced stages, typically for patients who are younger and uh, are healthier, because it's a more involved <coughs> type of process, and they need to have a suitable donor as well. And all patients at all stages need to be considered for clinical trials. So this is sort of what we have now and where 
um, the gaps are that we need that we need to fill. Um, it's an exciting time for CTCL because in um, so many decades now, we have two new approved treatments that are very effective. Those treatments are FDA approved and are commercially available with the right indication. In 2017, we have Rentoximab Vidotin, and it had shown superiority over um, what we call physician choice, which is usually is a big serotonin pill or a mesotrexate pill. Um, it works very well for patients who have advanced skin disease or skin tumors. Uh, we're looking at 50% response rate, about 50 pa patients treated on that trial have responded. And it led to an FDA approval in 2017. More recently, in 19, we have MOGA melizumab, which is also an antibody that targets a molecule on the surface of a lymphoma cell. So both of those agents are considered um, what you would call targeted Asian or precision medicine because they would target just the cancer cells with very limited informant of healthy organ. That's in comparison to the older Asian we use that fall more into the chemotherapy world, which would kill all rapidly dividing cell. So this is an exciting time for CTCL for sure. Those two agents, if they are indicated, they should be available uh, uh, to you through your, through your doctor. Uh, just a brief overview, um, how do we think about clinical trial? Um, the, first, the first step is what we call preclinical studies, where we think a drug is effective, we put it on cells and culture, maybe we give it to a mouse model of the disease and show that it works. And then the next step, as you see, is a phase one clinical trial and typically it's done in about 20, 30 some patients, where we give it an increasing doses to a patient with the right disease. And the idea is, or the end point of that trial is typically safe. We wanna make sure this is safe, this is not harmful to patients. That trial is not designed to, to detect if it's effective or not. But frequently we're able to glean enough knowledge from that trial to see if it's worthwhile to take to the next, to the next stage. A phase two, uh, typically sometimes lumped with a phase one for efficiency. So many of the trials we have for, uh, for CTCL or, or, or a lot of other uh, blood cancers is a phase one, phase two. So it's, uh, it started out as a phase one. There are patients treated at each dose level, a handful of them. And then if you treat like three patients and it's not toxic, you move off to the next uh, stage, next dose treat three more patients. Um, that's uh, uh, the typical what's called three plus three design. And then after you build multiple dose level, once you reach a dose level when you're not seeing toxicity, you would say, okay, this is a good dose that I can take to phase two. And then you typically would treat another somewhere between 20 to 40, 50 patients, depending on what you're trying to achieve at that highest dose. And that will give you an indication that the drug is effective. And then you would uh, go to the uh, FDA that regulates all uh, drug uh, uh, development in, in the United States, and you would tell them, okay, I have that agent, and then you discuss with them how you can best get it approved. That's usually what the drug companies do. And um, then the typical next step is that, you, that, that a phase three is designed where you would try to go with your new drug Again, it's the competitor, usually a drug that's already approved, and you just need to prove that this agent is superior to that drug for the FDA to allow the, the company to be able to sell to sell that 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 drug um, uh, 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 to patient, and usually their um, uh, insurers would would pay for it. So this is the usual. Uh, 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 process where how the drug starts out from being tested in on cells and in mice until it gets uh, approved. Um, now, this is not meant to be an exhaust an, uh, an exhaustive list of all available clinical trials. I'm just going to walk you through a few of the studies that are think that I think are most interesting or seem to be particularly promising. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, all the trials that I presented to you are available at, at, uh, at Ohio State. But certainly, if anything, in, 
in here that seem to be particularly appealing to you, you could go on clinicaltrial.gov and you can search the name of the drug and will tell you all of the centers that's available at. Uh, certainly, I think uh, through Susan, the Cutaneous Lymphoma mm -hmm. Foundation, they'll be, they'll be glad to guide you as well. Um, um, I, I, I don't know with all of the trials, all of the centers available at, but many of those uh, trials are available in multiple centers, but I'll, I'll mention that to you as we uh, move along the way. Um, this one particular trial, it's a, it's a phase two randomized. Randomized mean that patient get the new drug, which is Cobomarsip, versus a competitor. And the competitor they picked for that study is Vorinostat, which is a pill that's commercially available. And this is a registration trial. It means that the, what, what the company is hoping to achieve, that out of that trial, they will prove superiority to Vorinostat and they'll be able to get that drug licensed to be available for patients. Um, briefly, this drug is a novel compound. It works through interfering with RNA. Um, if you recall the basics of signaling through the cells, the DNA makes RNA and the RNA makes protein. And um, that step interferes with, with the RNA making, which would be uh, important to the survival of the cancer cell. Um, it is designed for patients who have mycosis fungoids, who have stage 1, B, 2, and 3. So all patients are included unless they have uh, a gross blood involvement. That agent from the preclinical studies that were done doesn't seem to work as well for patients who have Cesare syndrome, for instance. And this is the result of their uh, phase one trial that we participated in at Ohio State. And um, they treated 38 subjects and 92% um, of them have shown some uh, response. This complicated plot that you see basically show you the degree of skin improvement. We um, look at the patient's skin head to toe and measure how much the skin is involved and use a certain score. Uh, that's called uh, MSWAT. That's why you wonder when you participate in a, a, a clinical trial on CTCL, why do they keep taking uh, pictures of your whole body and measuring? That's because of that, because we have no good way of getting scans of the skin like if we do a clinical trial for something like lung cancer, we can just get CAT scans. But with the skin, everything on the skin. So we have to make sure that we look at the skin head to toe and take measurements and, and, and create scores. This is the only way that we'll be able to objectively, as much as possible, tell if the treatment is working or not. So the phase one trial where they use increasing doses of that agent seem to be particularly promising. We haven't seen much toxicity with that agent. It's typically given by intravenous infusion once a week, which can be a bit cumbersome at the beginning. Uh, the arrangement would be that if you would go on this trial, you will start in the uh, academic medical centers that have it, and you'll get it on a weekly basis. And then if it seems to be working for you, there is an option to transition to getting the agent through um, uh, a home, home health company. So they would come to your home eventually. That's the proposed arrangement, which would make it a lot more convenient. Uh, there is a flip of a coin, so you would either get that agent or you would get the Vorinostat pill. But then uh, there is, uh, this is the actual uh, design of the study. There is that randomization step you see in the diamond, where you would uh, either go on the experimental agent or the Vorinostat. They're looking to put 65 patients in each arm. Uh, the good thing about that, that if happened that on the flip of the coin, you end up with uh, 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 Vorinostat, the pill, which we think it's less effective and have more side effect, you would have the option to be rolled on a different protocol where you get the active agent, the Cobomarsin, the, the other protocols for prison. So when you get started on that trial, you have a way of getting the new drug, whether you initially when, when we flip the coin, go on the new drug or you go on the old pill. So that, that's a nice option to have that's built in there. Um, second trial I would like to tell you about, it's a new, uh, it's a new agent called BNZ1. It's also, um, 
a novel class of drug that interfere with the function of certain uh, molecules that the cell makes that are called cytokines. This is how cells talk to each other. You can think about them as micro hormones. They don't travel like hormones travel as a long distance and they can work in different parts of the body. Cytokines are typically work in close proximity to the cell that release them influencing the other cells. Um, that, that, uh, uh, with that particular drug, there have been a study in healthy volunteers and there have been no toxicity. So that's one reassuring step typically above and beyond most drugs that are in development. Um, there are 70 uh, subjects that are treated up to date and there have been no major toxicity. Um, what we have learned, we have this phase one trial open here at Ohio State and also at other institutions that it works better for patients who have early stage disease. So you can think about it in a sense as a little bit similar to the other agent we talked about, the cobomarsin. Uh, it works more for patients who have earlier stages. Uh, cobomarsin could work for patients who have skin tumors as well, but it's not, it's not a good agent for um, patients who have a more advanced disease like cesare or gross involvement of the blood. So again, this trial is more designed for patients with early stage. It's also given by intravenous infusion once a week. It had a short half-life. So that also could be um, a, a limitation from the way that's delivered. We have that trial also open and uh, because we have seen nice responses in patients with uh, uh, skin involvement with CTCL, uh, the company have expanded the trial to a two more patients with early stage disease. Um, this is another uh, trial that we have here at Ohio State. Uh, this is only available here. It's not open in, 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 in other centers. And with this, we combine an FDA-approved agent, which is brentoximab vidotin that you might be familiar with, uh, by infusion every three weeks, along with another drug called lenalidomide or Revlimid. That's a drug that's approved for other kinds of lymphoma, B-cell lymphoma, and also for myeloma, a different kind of blood cancer. And we give both in, uh, in combination. The idea is that they work synergistically. The infusion is every three weeks, so it seems to be more feasible for patients who live a little bit further out from, uh, from our center. Um, uh, the unique thing about that trial that's also open to patients who have less common kinds of cutaneous lymphoma. So a condition called lymphomatoid papillosis, which is typically a benign condition um, that's only treated with a simple treatment like methotrexate pills. Uh, but some cases are more advanced and they tend to behave in a more uh, aggressive way with involvement of the lymph node or with having extensive skin involvement. Typically, those patients are excluded from clinical trials. There's no good clinical trial for them because it's a rare condition. So with this particular clinical trial, we are including those patients as well. It's open for patients who have peripheral. Peripheral means systemic T-cell lymphoma inside the body, not necessarily involving the skin. Uh, so far, we have treated 17 patients, and we have seen responding about a third. Uh, this is more a trial for patients who have advanced um, advanced uh, disease. So all of the patients we treated of this trial, or most of them would have skin tumors or blood involvement. So this is uh, certainly a, a sicker population to treat. Uh, one thing to note here that I think is interesting, about half of the patients who were treated on that trial, within two rounds of treatment, they have 50% reduction in what we call skin dex. Skin dex is a score that patients would feel and will give us idea how they feel receiving the treatment. Uh, as many of you have experienced, itching is a big problem. And we have seen kind of immediate reduction of itching after receiving one or two rounds of treatment. We, we think on its own, even if the response as far as the regression of skin lesion is modest in some patient, at least the relief of the itch is something that have been uh, very welcomed by our patient because that seemed to be the one uh, uh, symptom that have been most detrimental to quality of life. Um, there are a few other agents that I want to tell you about that seem to be exciting. One of them is Aztecs. 
660. This is a phase one, two trial. Um, a phase one have been completed already. The phase one have been in multiple cancers, not just skin lymphoma. It included even things like uterine or cervical cancer. They targeted all cancer, but what they learned from the phase one that all of the responses they have seen have been in patients with cutaneous lymphoma. So that's where they decided to expand this trial on the phase two to patients who have advanced cutaneous lymphoma or would have uh, a systemic uh, 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 T-cell lymphoma. We have that phase portion of the trial open here. Um, this is one patient that was treated on a phase one uh, in another uh, institution, and he had skin tumors and almost a pretty rapid reduction in, uh, in, in the skin tumor. This would be, if you go back to the first chart where we looked at stages, uh, this would be a good trial for patients who have more advanced stage. So patients who have uh, skin tumors or Cesare syndrome, this would be a better trial for them. Um, this is another uh, exciting agent it's called CPI-818. And this is a brand phase one. So this will be first in human. Um, of interest, the, uh, uh, they have treated, there is um, a kind of skin lymphoma that involves the dogs that's very rare, that's very similar in its biology to cutaneous T cell lymphoma. It's a naturally occurring disease. It's not an experimental uh, 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 disease. It's something that happened naturally to dogs. It's very rare. And they did uh, uh, treat uh, 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 two dogs who, have, who had that condition with this drug just came as an, 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 an opportunity. And as you see one dog picture here, he had improvement in his skin. And then the lower panel, you would see improvement in the actual, this is, you see all of that blue is the involvement of the skin with lymphocytes that are all malignant and they're all gone here. So you can only see red. Uh, so this certainly seemed to be a promising agent. Uh, this is open for uh, uh, all skin, cutaneous T cell and also systemic lymphoma. It's a brand new phase one. So it's the first in human study. Uh, it's open across multiple centers, and we will have it here over the next couple of weeks as well, hopefully. Um, the last trial I want to bring to your attention, this was developed by my uh, colleague, Dr. Jonathan Brammer. Um, this is a, a trial designed how to optimize the outcome after having uh, allogeneic stem cell, same as bone marrow with some semantic difference. Uh, for patients who have uh, T-cell malignancies, that includes uh, a skin, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, systemic lymphoma, and a certain kind of uh, uh, leukemias as well. Um, the reason that that became as a need, if you recall at the beginning, I mentioned that this is about the only curative treatment we have for uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, but that's only a part of the uh, picture, you know, uh, uh, as they say, the devil is in the details. The truth is, although it's the one modality that has, carries uh, the only promise that we know of nowadays of cure, the truth is uh, there is only a minor proportion of patients that actually end up being cured who's doing this kind of transplant. So if you look at disease uh, like mycosis fungoids, 75% of patients would relapse after having allogeneic transplant. And some experts would debate that figure. They say it's not really 75, it's about 60 and whatnot. But more than half of them do relapse. With Cesare, it's a little bit better. Uh, but you wonder why do we even do it if the relapse rate is so high? The reason we do it because patients typically, when they relapse, if they started out with advanced stage or skin tumors, when they relapse, they relapse with patches or plaques. So they, as if reset the disease at a lower stage where instead of having chemo, they could deal with those limited skin lesion with applying a topical steroid and with, with a good quality of life. So the idea of developing that trial is to add one agent to the standard chemotherapy given with transplant with the, with the with the chemotherapy we give before the transplant, we call that conditioning. And there is a maintenance that goes on after uh, the patient recover from the transplant and leave the hospital. 
uh, the idea that that maintenance would be at a very low dose, so it should be very toxic, and would prevent that relapse. Um, the trial uses an uh, romidepsin, it's an agent that you uh, uh, might be familiar with. It's FDA approved for this condition. Uh, the dose is used is much smaller than the standard dose that's approved because after transplant, typically most patients are not feeling the best. So you want to be uh, careful in what you what you would give them. But the idea that with that particular design, you would try improve those figures of uh, 75% or 50% relapse and make it lower, hopefully without uh, incurring any more any more uh, toxicities. So um, I think this about uh, ends my presentation. Again, this is not meant to be um, an exhaustive list of all of the uh, options we have or all of the things we have in development. Just want to um, give you a flavor of what we have, what we're thinking about, what we're excited about, and tell you how we think about clinical trials and uh, or what is our sort process as we develop clinical trials. Uh, when do we recommend, for instance, um, for instance, a standard agent versus an experimental agent? And why do we recommend an experimental agent if we have so many standard options? Um, and kind of get you excited about the future. There is a lot of things that are being developed and, 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 and coming frequently hearing about the cancer diagnosis is always unsettling, even if the doctor do his best to tell you. It is at an early stage, it might not affect your life as much, but even hearing that on its own, there's usually after that a complete shut, shut down where nothing else is, is usually heard after that. So if, if anything would come out of this, I hope would be a message of hope that uh, uh, there's a lot of things that being developed. There's so many people who are uh, working hard, uh, uh, trying to uh, 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 change the history of the disease and hopefully have a, a positive impact on, 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 on patients' lives. Um, I think I'm going to stop here and I'll be glad to, to take any questions you have. Great. Well, I'm sure we'll have some questions. And I, I just want to thank you for that great sort of overview and review. And I always, as I always say, I always learn something. And now I have some more homework to do. You, you mentioned two trials that I'm not familiar with yet. So I'll have to have a conversation with you about those. Um, but we also, I just want to let folks know that um, we try our best to have all of the open kind of broad clinical trials that are across different centers on the web, our website as sort of a first pass. Um, obviously, clinicaltrials.gov has everything, but can sometimes be confusing and overwhelming. So I would suggest, you know, start with our website and the clinical trials, and you can see for many of them, um, the SOLAR trial and uh, Gosh, the, the couple of the others that you had mentioned are uh, on the website. And as the centers open and the different sites open and are available, we list those as well. So anyway, ours is a, a good place to start. Um, and then I would also say, and one of the messages that my take homes from what Dr. William was sharing is, you know, ask your physician about the options for clinical trials because uh, while there are some that are multi-center, there are some that happen at individual sites, um, and those might be a great option for you. So it's always a, a good idea to talk to your physician and ask them about uh, what clinical trials they're involved in and what's going on in the clinical trial realm to see if there's anything that may be appropriate for you, no matter what stage of your disease, because we have clinical trials going on in early stage through more aggressive advanced stage. And as you mentioned, Dr. William, even in at your institution, you're looking at how can you have a better impact on those patients with that have gone undergone transplant. So there's all kinds of different variations on the theme of clinical trials. And especially in a disease like ours that is is so different for almost every individual, it's really great to know that there's so much happening um, out there. So I'm excited.
Um, so now we'll open it up for some questions. Um, okay, so this gentleman says he has polyculodermic mycosis fungoides, 1B, so a, a little different variation. Um, he's had it for a long time, 35 years, uh, but he was only diagnosed two years ago. And they've done topical treatments, it looks like, uh, corticosteroids, some narrowband UVB, um, but he has not gotten any kind of remission. So he was asking what might he consider uh, at this point, which I know it's hard to, to sort of judge because every person is different, but perhaps you can give some guidance if someone's in that kind of a condition where they're not seeing um, perhaps the kind of remission or response with their current treatments. Sure, I think um, if there if there is an um, the the option of having access to a clinical trial that that would certainly be be ideal. Um, I'm a little bit surprised that there is not much response to light therapy with poikilodermis variant because that's typically among all my causes the one variant that have been associated with the best. Uh, overall uh, uh, response rate. So I would, I, 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 I would certainly urge you to, um, as a first step, have your uh, biopsy slides reviewed, perhaps by another pathologist, just to make sure that an accurate diagnosis has been reached. Uh, mycosis fungoids frequently overlaps with a lot of other uh, skin diseases. Having an expert pathologist look at the slides is really key to reach an accurate diagnosis. And there is a lot of nuances in, in that space. So I think that would be the first step that I recommend. If the diagnosis is indeed accurate, other agents should be considered. Um, typically, what we move on next, if we're not seeing an adequate response to light therapy, is an oral agent like uh, bixerotene. Sometimes you combine that with low dose interferon. Uh, but if clinical trials are an option available to you, uh, I would urge you to uh, consider consider that as well. Great, great. And, and I'll also mention that um, not all, but many of the current clinical trials are available uh, both in the U.S. and some are available in Canada and many are available in Europe as well. So, um, you know, it's not just limited to, to U.S. facilities, which is very exciting. Um, and one of the other reasons is, you know, we need to have a larger number of individuals participating in the clinical trials to, to be able to get uh, a, a better understanding across a lot of people how the agent works and and how uh, what the responses are. So again, for us as from the patient side, we can really help move things forward if we consider a clinical trial because sometimes the clinical trials get stuck if they don't have enough people enrolled in them to be able to get the data that's required to understand the effectiveness of a particular um, therapy and drug that needs to happen before they go to the FDA or to the European Medicines um, group for approval. So, you know, we are also helping to move the science forward if we uh, are able and it makes sense for us to participate in a clinical trial. Um, because otherwise, sometimes things get stuck and they, they can't move forward and then they're not available for anyone. So I'll sure. just put my little plug in for that. <laughs> Okay, um, our second question. Let's see. I've always been told that the sun is good for MF, and certainly my patches seem to respond well. However, I'm very moly, so probably somebody like me that has a lot of other um, marks on their skin and worry about UV light, uh, either th through treatment or through, this, through the sun, because of other problems. So how do you balance... It's a very good question. How do you balance the treatment effectiveness, especially if light is working with the potential longer term side effects or if you have fair skin like I do and, and a family history that might be predisposed to other kinds of skin cancers from the sun? You know, that's kind of a hard, a hard uh, balance to keep sometimes. 
Yeah, I, I, I don't think I really have a lot of uh, insight into that great question. Um, I, I would say if there is um, a documented history of melanoma or if there's a family history of melanoma and certainly consulting with um, uh, a dermatologist would be very helpful to uh, give you insight about how dangerous your moles are um, because not every uh, person who has a lot of moles are particularly at an increased risk for melanoma. So. Uh, the first stop would be with an experienced dermatologist and posing that question to him or her. If it turned out that you're indeed at a higher risk for melanoma or have had a melanoma in the past or have had a family history of melanoma, there are certainly other alternatives that does not include uh, light. Um, and we have those patients in, in our practice that don't that have had melanoma in the past or they have a strong family history of melanoma, and then light is not an option. But we have a lot of other things we could offer. Um, we could offer uh, total skin electron beam radiation if there is a lot of skin involvement. And as we are now, we don't, we don't believe that that increases the risk of development of uh, melanoma. Uh, there are oral agents like big serotonin and uh, and uh, inter interferon injections. We have clinical trials. There's a lot of other options, but I would say that being uh, moly on its own is not necessarily a contraindication to light therapy, but I think uh, uh, getting a good uh, uh, opinion from an experienced dermatologist about the true risk of melanoma would be a good start. Great suggestion. And uh... All right, like how we do, oh, here we go. See, that's always what happens. Um, do I have to do PUVA for lifetime if I'm in the first stage, early stage? Hmm, good question. Uh, it's a great question. I, I don't think anybody can have PUVA for lifetime. PUVA had to go on for a limited number of years because PUVA is different than narrow band that PUVA does increase the risk of uh, skin cancer with time, non-CTCL skin cancer. And that seemed to be proportionate to the duration of treatment. So after a certain number of a lifetime uh, exposure is given, PUVA had to be stopped regardless. So uh, nobody gets PUVA for a lifetime. It's limited by its very uh, nature. Uh, uh, as a choice between narrow band and PUVA is a little bit semantic, depending on your clinician preference and what their perception of uh, efficacy. Typically, PUVA works better for patients who have more uh, deeper skin lesion, like there's one uh, variant of mycosis called folliculotropic, where uh, the disease invades around hair follicles. It's, so it, it then creates deeper in the skin. So narrow band light therapy doesn't seem to work as well for that. So um, certainly uh, if PUVA had been uh, uh, recommended for you by your uh, physician, I would urge you to ask uh, first question, why PUVA in preference to narrow band? And uh, 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 I would reassure you that nobody takes PUVA for a lifetime. It's usually at the lifetime maximum dose. And then after that, it had to be stopped. Right, right. And the good news is that we've got a lot of other things in clinical trials that uh, hopefully going forward, we'll have more options in the toolbox where we can mix and match and you can do, you know, uh, a chunk of one treatment and, and, and then when that stops working, you can go to something else and kind of do, a, we, we'll have more to, to work with than perhaps we have today, which is which is the good news. Okay, um, if I miss a treatment, can I just go outside to get sun on my skin? Ah, always a good question. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I assume the question relates to narrow band. I mean, there mm -hmm. is really no harm of getting sun on the skin in general, as long as you are careful and make sure that you're not getting a lot of sun, you're not getting burned and all of that. So the same rules that would apply to a, uh, a fair skin person who doesn't have 
CTCL apply as making sure you have sunscreen and you're not getting burned. Uh, but there is no particular harm in missing one treatment. I mean, um, treatment had to be designed around the person's life and uh, we all have busy lives. You have a lot of uh, obligations and things you have to attend to. So if you miss one treatment, it's not the end of the world. I would urge you as uh, feasible, try to remain or try to be faithful to the treatment course that's designed to you by your doctor because light therapy takes longer to work. If you are more faithful at the beginning and do the session three times a week or two times a week, the minimum is two times a week. Usually three times a week is necessary with narrow band. Um, the quicker you will see the response and the faster you can move on to uh, a maintenance phase where you have to go once a week. And certainly uh, patients who have responded well to light therapy, that's an option. I would urge you to talk to your doctor as well about the possibility of getting a light box at home. Some insurance would cover that. It's, uh, except, it's an exception, not the rule typically, but that can make your life a whole a lot easier, especially if you have responded well to light therapy. Then you would have the treatment at your home. You can do it at your convenience. You don't have to travel to uh, a dermatologist's office. The treatment is supervised by your dermatologist because they have to enter a code into the machine and, and whatnot, so you cannot overdo it. They have to uh, sort of authorize the treatment for you. It's the same when you uh, uh, lock, lock the iPad for your children, which program they can use and which program they cannot use. Uh, your physician would have a similar kind of control over your light box uh, at, at home as well. So if it's covered by insurance and if it's deemed that light therapy is helping you, would be uh, would be a good choice. Yeah, and uh, we have a list of the light box companies on the website too that offer home units. So you can uh, go there and check those out and, and most of them will help you with the insurance coverage as well. Uh, although I will say that right now, Medicare gives us a bit of a challenge and sometimes people get their light boxes covered and some people don't. And we're trying to work on some uh, back channels to make that more accessible for folks, but it's a, a bigger project um, and it'll take us some time, but, but give it a try and you can at least get started by checking out the different companies on our website. So thank you for that. Ah, oh, this is a good question. <clears throat> this has come up um, time and time, but what can I do about feeling tired? And I, I guess that is, is hard to answer because it depends on the person, it depends on the treatments, it depends on their overall health. Um, sure. But I don't know if you have any, any words of wisdom for folks that might be feeling perhaps a little more fatigued um, either from treatments or it could even be just from the kind of the emotional, physical right. impact of having to be on treatment or in a treatment for long periods of time. Um, I would say the irony is the one thing about being tired, regardless of what the cause is, I mean, certainly the first step is to uh, make sure your physician is aware and he have addressed everything that could be addressed. There are a few low hanging fruits, if you will, that need to be looked at and anybody who's tired, whether they have CTCL or not. Uh, thyroid function for instance should be checked. That's something very easy to fix about uh, fourth or a third of the population, the other population have hypofunction of their thyroid gland. Some of the medicines we use to treat CTCL causes hypofunction of the thyroid gland. So that would be something that would be very easy to check. Um, the one thing, and after all of the, the so-called organic things have been excluded, uh, one key thing is um, ironically, exercise works better if you are tired. So 
<laughs> giving God with a feeling of being tired can only make it worse. So trying to commit to a low intensity exercise program uh, that could have uh, a, a tremendous uh, positive impact on quality of life. Because as Susan alluded to, um, we are compli complicated creatures. Our mind affects a lot how our body functions. So um, exercise certainly reduces stress. It releases a lot of substance inside the brain naturally. It's the same substance that uh, uh, drugs like morphine release. They give a sense of relief of pain. They give a sense of uh, pleasure, relief of tension. So all of that could be obtained in the uh, uh, natural, healthy way by trying to adhere to a low frequency exercise. Uh, eating healthy is also helpful. Uh, there is a lot of oxidative damage that, that can happen with uh, uh, consuming calorie rich foods. I would urge you though, since I just said that, I wanna warn you that not to, since we're talking about nutrition is another common question that usually I, I get asked. Uh, don't don't buy into the, the the myth of cutting on sugar and cutting on gluten and all of that because uh, people will try to sell you expensive diets and regimens and whatnot that there is no science behind. They're not covered by insurance. Will be paying a lot of money and you might not be even getting enough nutrition by cutting down on calorie. Going on low carb diet is extremely uh, 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 can extremely negatively influence your mood. We need some some carbs for our uh, uh, brains and neurotransmitter to function properly. So I would say common sense in the middle of the road, eating healthy, adhering to a low frequency uh, exercise, and talk to other patients, join support, group, uh, support groups, uh, 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 Susan certainly and the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation have done a, a tremendous work. It can connect you with others, attend events. Uh, part of the struggle that many of my patients feel that they feel isolated. So uh, diseases like uh, breast cancer or colon cancer are very common. So you could easily in your small town connect with similar individuals who are suffering from this. Uh, but with a rare disease like CTCL, maybe you need to get on the, you know, the social media and connect to other folks who have your similar disease. It can be very comforting to know that there are, there are other folks who are having your same uh, set of struggles. And that on its own can be very uh, 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 uplifting. Uh, in my experience, fatigue is usually more uh, mental, emotional, then it is organic. But by all means, uh, a careful search for all organic causes need to be undertaken. Good advice. And I'll also just toss in my two cents with regards to getting enough sleep. Because I think, yes. especially in our society, we don't always get enough sleep, and that's problematic as well. Oops, sorry, that's my phone. Um, well, uh, we're coming up to the hour here. Uh, Mike, we've got some more questions. I, I don't want to um, extend, here we go, okay. Um, excellent information and thank you. This is gonna be an interesting one. Uh, can you comment on CAR-T research and or CAR-T clinical trials? And I'm assuming in relationship to cutaneous lymphoma versus just in general. Every, yeah. Great question. I think CAR T causes uh, uh, creates a, a, a lot of, of, of promise. Certainly, the results in B cell lymphomas have been outstanding. Uh, it changed the natural history of the disease. Um, the problem, just briefly, there is a lot of uh, 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 technical information there. But briefly, we don't have. To develop a good CAR T cell, you need to have a good target on the cancer cell that differentiates it from other normal cells. 
The problem is with most T cell lymphoma, we don't have such a good target. All of the targets we have as we are now are shared on other normal cells. So it becomes a little bit problematic to eliminate all T cells. I mean, with uh, the cards developed for B cell lymphoma, they eliminate all B cells from the body, but B cells are uh, dispensable. A person can lose all of their B cells in adult life and live healthy. You could just as, uh, infuse them the protein that B cells eventually make when they mature into plasma cell, and that should be sufficient. They'll become like diabetics or hemophiliacs. They just need, you need to give them the protein and they will be fine. T cells are way more complicated. So if you get rid of all T cells or one major subtype of T cells, the patient will become like an AIDS patient. They cannot live. So there are a few things that are in development. Uh, the CD30 target that's used in brentoximab vidotin. There are clinical trials around that. You could find them on clinicaltrial.gov. You could look at CD30 cars. Uh, again, this is only a subset of patients who express CD30. We don't think that that will work for patients who don't express CD30. Uh, there is um, a car targeting another uh, 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 marker called CD7. I believe that's available in Baylor. Um, CD7 cells, again, is also a subset of patients who express the CD7 of their cancer cells. If you don't express that, that trial is not gonna, it's not gonna help you. With B cells, it's less complicated because all B cells express that one marker called CD19, and you could just push delete and get rid of all B cells and patient will be fine. Um, but it's a bit more complicated for T cell. It's still in its infancy, I would say. Uh, we are working on a few similar things that are still in the very early uh, stage here at Ohio State. Um, uh, but there are few CAR T trials that are available in other uh, institution. I, I would, uh, to give you a, a good advice, I would urge you, if you pull up a trial that seemed to be interesting to you from clinicaltrial.gov. Um, do your due diligence of communicating with a clinical research coordinator at that center and, and ask them, and many of them will be willing to do so if you ask, uh, perhaps a little bit persistently. Uh, ask them to, to what we call pre-screening. Send them, don't send them 200 pages of records. They wouldn't be able to go through all of that. Perhaps send them the last few notes from your doctor and uh, a copy of your pathology report and the last set of blood work, that might be all what they need. And they could quickly pre-screen you and tell you tentatively that you might be eligible for that trial or not before you go through the hassle of traveling and uh, booking a flight mm -hmm. and find a hotel to go there for them to tell you you're not eligible. I mean, certainly there's no promise that when you come there, something else they would find that did not show on the first screen and you would not be eligible, but still uh, there is a good chance that if you pass that initial pre-screen, that when you get there, you'll be eligible for the trial. So I would urge you to do that before you would, before you would travel. Hmm. That's very good advice. Susan, it's Mike. I just have, uh, I think I'm going to read the last two pairs of okay. questions here because they're a little okay, long. Go for it. So um, okay. the first one is my husband has CTCL, MF, uh, lympho lymph lymphomatoid papulosis stage 2B T3. He's hesitant to try brentuximab because of the neuropathy side effect. Does that go away after the treatment is done? He's already tried steroids, UVB, and bexeratine. Okay, I think that's, uh, that's a great question, and it's actually easy to answer. I think um, if brentoximab is doses decreased 
or help at the earliest sign of neuropathy, uh, your husband should be okay. So if he had no pre-existing neuropathy and uh, as your uh, um, uh, doctor uh, would be careful to um, uh, uh, decrease the dose or hold the treatment when you start developing neuropathy, then the neuropathy would in progress to an advanced stage. The problem happened when the patient start developing neuropathy symptoms and um, the drug continue to be pushed. I think that what creates a problem. So I would say certainly be vigilant about symptoms of neuropathy, pins and needle in hand and feet, uh, weakness, bring those to the attention of your doctor right away to make sure that he's reducing the dose properly. If you do that, I think the, re the long-term risk will be really minimal. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I, I think that's really good advice. I think we, as the patients, have to not be afraid to tell our clinicians that something seems to be awry. I know many people kind of brush it off or think, oh my gosh, this is working and I don't, I don't want to go off of it, so yeah, I'll yeah. just kind of wait. But the reality is, and I think in particular with um, brentuximab and the potential for neuropathy, which doesn't happen for everyone either, but you, we as the patient need to have that relationship with our clinician and the comfort level to say, this is feeling a little weird. Maybe yes. we, you know, let's, do we back yes. off the dose? You know, you have yeah. to, it's a partnership, right? It's, it's back and forth and that's, a good approach. No, thank okay. you, Susan, for making that great point, because remember, although it might sometimes seem that that's not true, your doctor is on your side. So when he asks mm -hmm. you about if you're having trouble, he's not trying to stop your treatment. He just want to make sure you're not being hurt. So be transparent with him. Uh, I can tell you, I have had patients where they develop neuropathy and I continued the drug because it was the only option they have because their disease seemed dangerous. But then that doesn't happen automatically. That happens after a good sit down discussion. We weigh benefits and risks, mm -hmm. but it's not like, okay, I'm going to tell him I'm having this problem. He'll take away the drug that helps me. That's not true. Um, I, I, I think it's, uh, uh, your doctor's always, is always on your, on your, on your side and it will be most helpful for him to give you a good advice to know everything that's going on. Right. Okay. And then the very last, uh, set of questions here from uh, one person, um, I've had six biopsies, but no official diagnosis. One doctor said mycosis fungoides. Um, I've had severe night sweats, fatigue thirsty, itching, my age is 67, my hormones have been checked, all good. I have hot flashes during the day. What can I do to help myself? I went to MD Anderson, no diagnosis. Also, how will I know nothing is attacking other organs in the body? I just worry so much. Okay, I let me answer the last part first because that's the easier part. If there is no cells in the blood and there is no lymph nodes or enlarged organ or CAT scan or PET scan, you can be rest assured that nothing is attacking anything inside the body. So that's easy. If those don't show anything, it's unlikely that there is a hidden cancer that's threatening your life that we cannot see. Assuming that you have underwent all of the necessary screening for your age as far as colonoscopy and all of that good stuff. Now, um, uh, the diagnosis part is a little bit tricky because uh, making a diagnosis of CTCL could be uh, uh, challenging. It is usual for the patient to require multiple biopsies in their lifetime until an accurate diagnosis is reached. However, it would be comforting that for those borderline cases, it's not like a diagnosis is missed and then it becomes an invasive cancer and it takes a person's life within a few months. That doesn't happen. The way we think about CTCL is a spectrum of disorders start out with some 
skin inflammation. There is some overlap with other benign behaving skin disorder like psoriasis. And then it evolves over time. So the initial biopsy might not be diagnostic, but a biopsy two years later could be diagnostic. And during those two years of wait, there is no harm that's particularly done. I would say uh, if you have went to a, a big center that had a lot of experience like MD Anderson and they assured you that you don't have CTCL, I think you could be uh, comfortable in that regard. It doesn't mean that your biopsy wouldn't become diagnostic in two years, but in those two or three years or whatever, you haven't lost any mileage. It's not like, gee, if we have picked this early enough, my life has changed. It's not true. Uh, so there is no harm in waiting. As we uh, uh, alluded to earlier, a lot of the symptoms of tiredness and night sweat and all of that, uh, after everything have been adequately checked, you have had scans, you have had blood work, you have seen experienced clinicians, a lot of that could be uh, mental, emotional. Uh, the, the mind had a lot of authority over the body. So I would say my advice is if you have seen experienced clinician and you have had a thorough workup, try to uh, distract your attention from that concern by doing other activities or other things and follow with your doctors as they have recommended. It's extremely unlikely that they have missed something that would be uh, a, 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 threat to your, a threat to your life. If the biopsy is turned positive in another year from now, there is no harm would have been done. It's not like if they have treated you a, a year earlier, that would have made a difference. So hopefully uh, that will provide some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, reassurance. I can tell you an anecdote from my experience as a, as a lymphoma clinician, and that's true for both mycosis fungoid CTCL as well as for B cell lymphomas. I can tell you that half of the patient I see after receiving a lymphoma diagnosis would have night sweats. Just because clinicians were in tune to ask that question all the time, and they go in and read and hear that's a symptom. And half of them would tell me they have night sweat after the diagnosis. And then when I go back and ask them, have you have night sweat before the diagnosis? Many of them didn't. They go back uh, with, their, with their memory. Some do. I mean, some night sweats are real. The kind of night sweats that we worry about are typically not subtle. The kind of night sweats we worry about are drenching. That mean that your, your nightgown or pyjama and uh, the linens are all soaked in sweat. They're typically associated with toxic symptoms. A person's unable to eat. They're losing weight. It's usually not a subtle thing. The real thing is usually not subtle uh, 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 by, by, by any means. Uh, I, I, I hope that, that, that helped that help reassure you some, but by, by all means, continue to follow with your uh, clinicians and, 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 and follow what, the, what their advice for you. Well, very good words of wisdom and some good advice. And uh, I think that will, uh, it's a good way to wrap up our evening. So thank you so much for joining us as we kick off our fall season with our Facebook Live programs and our in-depth discussion about clinical trials and what's available and, uh, you know, encourage you to do your own research and go out. Again, you can start with our website uh, and we've got several of the clinical trials listed there or go out to clinicaltrials.gov and follow up with your physician, have the conversation. Um, and just know that there are clinical trials going on for early stage disease as well as for more aggressive and advanced stage. So across the board, which is really, really exciting. So I encourage you to um, do your own research and hopefully this evening's program has been insightful and helpful to you in your own journey. And thank you so much, Dr. William, for joining us.